Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on hepatitis advocacy, understanding federal appropriations. My name is Rhea Racho. I'm the Public Policy and Program Manager for the Hepatitis B Foundation. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to start things off by reviewing a few housekeeping items and sharing details on how you can participate in the webinar. So first, if you experience any audio issues on your computer, there's also a call-in option that's noted on the screen. And you can also find this number within your GoToWebinar control panel. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode and will be muted throughout the presentation. But at any time during the presentation, you are welcome to submit questions by typing them into the chat box in the GoToWebinar control panel. We will be reviewing your questions um, as they come in and we will have time for Q&A after the presentation. And lastly, please note that this webinar is being recorded. You will receive an email with a link to view and share the recording after the webinar. All right. So the purpose of today's webinar is to provide an introduction to the federal budget and appropriations process, an overview of appropriations advocacy strategies, and updates on coalition-based efforts to advocate for increased funding and support for viral, viral hepatitis prevention programs in the United States. We were really glad to see that so many of you were interested in this topic and were able to join us today um, because it's so important in this effort to have more and more community advocates engaged in speaking out about the severe lack of funding and resources that we have available for working towards the elimination of hepatitis B and C. Um, so to help us better understand the appropriations process and ways we can all engage in advocating for hepatitis funding, today we have two excellent panelists joining us, Emily McCloskey and Frank Hood. Emily is an Associate Director on the Policy and Legislative Affairs team at the National Association of State and Territorial AIDS Directors, or NASDAD. Since joining NASDAQ in 2011, Emily has represented governmental public health, HIV, and hepatitis programs to Congress, federal government and partners, and national and community stakeholders with a focus on HIV and hepatitis appropriations. Emily co-chairs the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership AIDS Budget and Appropriations Coalition. Um, she also is the coordinator of the Hepatitis Appropriations Partnership. Our second panelist, Frank Hood, serves as the Hepatitis C Policy Associate at the AIDS Institute in Washington, D.C. In this role, Frank works on policy and appropriations efforts on the federal and state level, advancing the AIDS Institute's goal of increased surveillance, testing, and treatment access for people living with viral hepatitis. Previously, Frank worked at the National Health Law Program. He has also worked as a community, political, and union organizer for a labor union and several political candidates. Um, before we begin with the presentations, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, today's webinar is co-hosted by HEP United, the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable, and the Hepatitis Appropriations Partnership, and we'd like to take a few moments to share a bit about our organization. Um, so HEP United was founded in 2012 by the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Association of Asian Pacific Health Organizations, or APCHO. HEPI United it is, is a national coalition of more than 35 members across 18 states and the District of Columbia. We represent a variety of sectors, including health clinics, local and state health departments, community-based social service organizations, and academic and research institutes. Um, our coalition is dedicated to reducing the health disparities associated with hepatitis B by increasing awareness, screening, vaccination, and linkage to care for high-risk communities. Um, we serve as a voice for hepatitis B advocacy nationally and locally, advocating for increased resources for hepatitis B prevention and treatment. Um, and then to introduce NVHR, I, we have Elizabeth on the line. I'll pass it over to her to talk about their coalition. Thanks, Rhea. This is Elizabeth Poxtis um, here on behalf of the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable, NVHR. Um, MVHR is a national coalition working together to eliminate hepatitis B and C in the United States. Um, MVHR is excited for inviting MVHR to co-sponsor this webinar. Um, and thanks very much. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. And finally, Emily, um, our panelist, is also representing NASDAQ and, and HAP, our final um, co-host, co so I'll turn it over her, to her. Thanks, Raya. Um, so I'm going to start off by just kind of explaining what NASDAQ is. So NASDAQ is a, not, it's a national nonprofit that represents public health officials who administer both the HIV and hepatitis programs that are set, funded by state and local governments. Um, so, in, so we're in all 50 states, the DC, um, the territories, and some uh, directly funded cities. And so our uh, mission is to end the intersecting epidemics of HIV, hepatitis, and related conditions by strengthening domestic and global governmental public health through advocacy, capacity building, and social justice. And we hope to see a world free of HIV and hepatitis. We're gonna... uh, so to talk a little bit about what the Hepatitis Appropriations Partnership is, the Hepatitis Appropriations Partnership began in 2004 as the Hepatitis C Appropriations Partnership, but in, hep in 2010, after many years of working with our Hepatitis C partners, we thought it was time to, you know, officially get married and become the Hepatitis <laughs> Appropriations Partnership, also known as HAP. And so that happened in 2010. Um, so HAP is a national coalition that is based in D.C. Uh, it includes community-based organizations, public health and provider associations, hepatitis and HIV organizations, and diagnostic pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies from all over the country. So we're a little bit unique um, in that way that we do have um, companies that are involved, but we also have quite um, a public health plant. Um, so we work with federal policymakers in Congress and the executive branch and with public health officials to ensure the increased support for federal support and funding for hepatitis prevention, testing, education, research, and surveillance and treatment. And most of our appropriations work is done uh, to, with the Division of Viral Hepatitis at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. Great, thanks, Emily. So we're just gonna pause really quick for some audience participation. Um, you should see a poll popping up right now. Since you just heard all about who we are, we wanna know more about where you all are coming from. Um, so the poll should have, okay, the poll should have just popped up, so we just wanna Take a moment for you guys to answer this question about which sector you are representing. Okay, it looks like a lot of you have already responded, so I'm seeing that 63% are coming from state or local health departments. 19% um, said national nonprofit or community-based organization, um, and 11% said other. And it looks like we've got a few academic or research institute and federally qualified health centers, clinics, or community health centers. So that's great. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to actually put up a second question now to give us an idea um, of how much you guys already know about the federal budget and appropriations process. Um, so the question should have just popped up and we'll pause for a few seconds for you guys to answer. All right. Okay, so it looks like our most popular answer is that we know very little about the process. <laughs> um, in second place, it uh, looks like a lot of you have some knowledge about the process, um, some who do not know anything about the process, and very few who would say that they know a lot. Um, so it's great. We're glad that you guys are able to join in order to increase your knowledge about this today. Um, the very last poll is a pop, it's a pop quiz. Um, how much funding does the CDC Division of Viral Hepatitis currently receive?
Okay. It's telling me that about 76% of you have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. <laughs> um, so this one was a little bit of a trick question because you may remember that all of our promotion for this webinar said that the CDC Division of Viral Hepatitis currently receives 34 million. But as of last week, the FY 2018 budget that was released um, included a $5 million increase for viral hepatitis. So the correct answer as of currently today for FY 2018 is 39 million. So that was a little bit of a trick, but <laughs> um, we'll learn more about that, which just happened and more about the process from Emily. Uh, but thank you all for partaking in that activity. I'm happy to pass it back over now to Emily too. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so. Thanks so much. Um, so I thought today um, we would talk a little bit about the budget and appropriations process. Um, so we are going to sort of start with a 101 about exactly kind of what happens in the appropriations and budget process and then what that means for hepatitis. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over, or Frank is going to talk about sort of how we advocate as a hepatitis community. So there are two kinds of um, funding. Mandatory and discretionary. Discretionary funding is set at the discretion of Congress, so it is divided into 12 appropriations bills that must pass each year to continue operations. And that is where CDC, NIH, and many of the programs that we receive federal funding for or care about the federal funding um, are located. There's also mandatory funding that is enacted by law, and it's not actually dependent on appropriations bills. So that includes Medicare and other entitlement programs. Um, interest on the debt, and mandatory funding like the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which does sometimes touch the um, public health spending. And to change that spending, they usually have to change eligibility rules as opposed to changing year-to-year -year, um, funding. So discretionary funding is divided into two pots, defense discretionary and non-defense discretionary. It's kind of, I guess you could say a little obvious, but not always. Um, so defense discretionary involves military personnel, procurement, operation, and maintenance. And non-defense discretionary is basically everything else. Um, but it does include veteran benefits and law enforcement, as well as public health. And I point this out because a lot of times uh, we'll hear in the news about the need to increase defense spending. But usually that is going to come um, because they have an overall cap of money for all the discretionary spending. And if when they propose increased defense cuts. It usually comes out of the non-defense discretionary pot. And non-defense discretionary is just because it's such a large group of things, it's a little harder to describe, and non-defense discretionary is not really a descriptor. So it's a little bit harder to, you know, kind of publicize how important this funding is. So once um, funding, once they decide on a funding amount for the year, um, which is usually the which is, which is determined in budget resolution, it's called the 302A allocation. And that is the spending amount that is set by the House and Senate Budget Committees for the Appropriations Committee. So that's the amount of kind of discretionary funding that they will use for all pro government programs, both defense and non-defense. And that 302A allocation then divides into 12 separate 302B allocations. So each um, Appropriations Committee has 12 subcommittees. Um, and the one that we kind of care the most about is labor, health, and human services, and education, um, and other related agencies is the full name. Um, and so each uh, subcommittee will get a 302B allocation, and that is the amount of money that they have to sort of divide amongst all of the programs with, within their jurisdiction. Uh, so as I'll tell you um, in a few minutes, the plans sometimes go awry. Um, about kind of how we do our government funding. So I'm going to explain sort of the whole process in a minute, but I wanted to sort of introduce these kind of uh, what these things mean. So and we'll find that at the end of almost every fiscal year, we are looking at either an omnibus, a continuing resolution, or a cromnibus. So an omnibus is usually a package of appropriations bills. It can be all 12. It can be a smaller group, um, and it's passed as one larger bill as opposed to 12 individual bills. And continuing resolution is a piece of legislation that continues funding amounts from the previous fiscal year for a set amount of time. Um, so usually Congress will use this as they're still trying to hammer out exactly how they want to spend money. And then there's a the special problem of us, and that is a spending package that combines both individual spending bills and a continuing resolution for other portions of government funding. And this one is especially important because labor, health, and human services bill is always the most controversial. 
Um, and almost every year, we're sort of under this threat of having the Labor uh, Health and Human or LHHS bill be under CR while everything else is under omnibus. So luckily, we haven't had a omnibus in a while, but it has happened in the past few years. So um, appropriators also use spending bills to enact policy change, um, usually in the form of policy riders or report language. So policy riders are typically used to prohibit use of funding. Um, we have seen this in the past with syringe access uh, funding. I guess technically we see it now because you cannot spend any money on the purchase of syringes while you can spend it on other services. And then the report language uh, serves as sort of the narrative to appropriation bills. So it can direct funding to provide it to discrete projects, require new activities like reports to Congress. It can also restrict the use of funding. The House is required um, to spread a report. The Senate is not, but they usually still do. So this timeline is kind of how things are supposed to work. So in February, the second Monday of February, the president is supposed to submit a budget request. Um, this has been occasionally um, delayed. I think this year we were delayed by a week. Uh, in other years, we've been delayed much more, but by the second Monday of February is supposed to be budget day. One of my favorite days of the year, usually. Um, in April, by April, usually the House and Senate will have adopted their budget resolutions, which is where they determine their 302A allocations. Um, and then usually by May, the Appropriations Committee will have made their 302B allocations to the 12 subcommittees. Then both the House and the Senate subcommittees will mark up their appropriations bills, which means that they will write an appropriations bill, they will have a hearing on it where um, people can offer amendments, um, we'll sort of see where they've set their mark um, for what they're anticipating for government funding. By June, the House full committee, so we'll go from the subcommittee to the full appropriations committee, they will ratify the bill. Now, I'm speaking in theory here, just to be <laughs> clear. Um, the, the bill will then go to the floor, there will be a debate, it will be voted on. The Senate starts their process a little bit later. So, you know, through July through September, they're going through a similar thing. Um, so, by, you'd say by September 1, both the House and the Senate have passed their individual Labor, Health, and Human Services bill through the floor process. And then in September, they appoint a conference committee, which is um, a group of members from both sides of the aisle and both the House and the Senate to debate kind of where, hammer out the differences and where the two bills are. They pass, they come up with one piece of legislation, they pass that back through the House and back, back through the Senate, and they send that to the president to vote by October 1st, which is when the new fiscal year begins. Now, what really happens? Um, so even when things begin on time, they are almost never done on time. Congress uses continuing resolutions to fund the government for finite periods. Uh, and so during that, programs are generally flat funded. And then, Usually they are able to actually go through that process with, I'd say, three bills. Um, so then they'll usually kind of take the outstanding bills and frequently bundle them in an omnibus or minibus measure. So you'll see in this chart, um, this is how many days we have actually had um, continuing resolutions or temporary measures for the past kind of 17 fiscal years. Um, so while we only had five continuing resolutions, um, this year, you can see that that was almost half the entire fiscal year. Um, in 2013, they failed to reach any sort of agreement and they had to do a full long, full year long CR. Um, we also saw that in 2011 and in 2007. Um, so it is very rare for the appropriations process to actually work the way that it is supposed to. So as Rhea said, um, the FY 2018 was finalized on Friday, and this included a $5 million increase for the Division of Viral Hepatitis. Um, work on FY 2019 has begun in earnest. So the President's budget came out in February, as I've said. Um, it requested flat funding from FY 2017. Obviously, FY 2018 was not, we didn't know we were going to get $5 million. So they did request $34 million, sort of flat funding and sort of a cut. Um, in the CDC's uh, request, though, they included a new program known as the Elimination Initiative. Um, that was a $40 million program that was uh, about opioids and infectious diseases. It is not related to the vision of viral hepatitis, but we would assume that we would see some hepatitis-related funding there. The House has started their process. They actually, their deadline 
for congressional requests has passed, but they have not scheduled an appropriations markup yet. The Senate deadline is mid-April. Um, and this year is incredibly complicated because of the election. Typically, um, Congress will go on recess for the month of October, if not a little bit before, so that they are able to campaign. Um, so there are very few working days between, I guess you can say we're almost, we're basically at April and um, the end of the fiscal year. So it'll be very interesting to see what they do. Because of the election, um, things are a bit more complicated to be voting on cuts to programs that are important to people is comes with complications on the campaign trail. So it will be interesting to see how that uh, impacts the appropriations process. But now Frank is going to talk about sort of how we do advocacy. Before we move on to Frank, um, I just want to remind everybody, well, thank you, Emily, for the presentation. I just want to remind everybody that you can submit questions at any time in the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and we're going to do one more quick audience poll as Frank is about to talk about advocacy strategies. We were curious to see how many of you have ever met with your member of Congress um, or their office to advocate for increased funding for viral hepatitis programs. Okay, so I'm pulling up the results now, and it looks like the majority, 64%, have never done this. About 24% have, and 12% have not visited or met with, but have called or emailed, which is also a great strategy. Um, thanks for giving us an idea of uh, kind of y'all's involvement. That is one of the strategies that we're going to talk about um, so I'm going to turn it over to Frank now to give us an overview of appropriations, advocacy strategies um, that we're working on here in D.C., but also that you can get involved in. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, my portion of the webinar is going to look at the advocacy techniques that we use here in D.C. to influence the appropriations process Emily just described and how we've applied those advocacy techniques to our ask. So oftentimes I'll talk with people in the states who are like, think that the work we're doing in DC is super complex or complicated, and the truth is it's actually quite straightforward and, and very grassroots based. Um, so my hope is to eliminate you all on some of the work we're doing here and, and uh, draw the comparison to the work that you're doing in the state, county, or city level uh, to advance the advocacy causes there. Uh, but before we get started, what is our advocacy ask? Uh, it is an additional $95 million for CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis, and uh, as we learned from the trick uh, pop quiz question, uh, the Division of Viral Hepatitis is currently funded at $39 million, which is just not enough money given the uh, significant increases in new cases of hepatitis B and C we've seen across the country, uh, especially in areas um, hard hit by the opioid crisis. So the hope is that this additional money would uh, be able to be given to the division to be used to increase testing, um, to do more active and robust surveillance, um, new prevention campaigns, since there's a shift in where these new cases are coming, and uh, you know a larger focus on heavily impacted areas. But you know you might ask then, well, this seems like a really good cause. Why would there need to be multiple, why, why would we have to ask for this at all, let alone use multiple techniques to try to do so? So the answer to that question is the rule of seven, uh, which is used in marketing and political campaigns. And as Ray described during my bio, um, is an area that I've, I've worked in, but it basically says someone needs to hear your message seven times before they're compelled to action. Uh, this is a longstanding rule that I will say is not really a valid rule anymore because especially when things go viral, you don't need to see it seven times to, to get in, you know, get behind it or, or watch it or anything like that. But it provides an important lesson in that the most successful way to, to do an argument is to repeat it and to present it in more than one way. Um, so these are some of the, the ways, and I'm actually going to describe six ways, which I guess violates the rule of seven, <laughs> but, um, you know, there are other smaller items that we can do as well, uh, but these are the big six ones that we do here in D.C. So the first one are Hill visits, and this is a meeting 
where uh, an individual or a group of people come together and meet with a congressperson staff. Um, in, it can be someone based out of D.C. for like a national coalition, or it could be a Hill Day when out-of-town people are in D.C. going and doing meetings with their, their congressmen um, here in D.C., but it's the person who represents them back, back in the state. Uh, normally, they're, they're done on Capitol Hill in a congressperson's office, although we've done plenty out in hallways or in cafeterias or just walking around the Capitol grounds. And, and they range anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour or more. Uh, in fact, this year, uh, we were on a hill visit that ran more than an hour because the staff person was, was new to this issue area, but really, really wanted to get up to speed on what was happening and asked a bunch of really good questions. So um, there are other ones that go 10 minutes that are, it's because they, the person knows everything there is that needs to be known. And really, it's just a, you know, talking to people you're friends with, and it, it's a quick meeting. But really, these hill visits offer an opportunity to connect with uh, the staff person uh, of a, a, an elected official that uh, either sits on an important committee or just is in, representing an area that is important to the issue being advocated on. And for each of these uh, techniques I'm going to go through, I'm going to list some pros and cons, uh, just so you get the general sense as to why some happen more often than others. So for hill visits, they're technically free. It's not like members of Congress charge you to, to schedule a meeting with them. Um, when you're walking on the Capitol Hill, they don't charge an admission. Uh, it just takes some time which will, to, to schedule everything, which we'll get into in a, a moment. Uh, another great pro, and, and one I think is, is one of the most important, is that uh, Hill visits offer an opportunity for your passion to shine through. So let's say that you're saying the exact same words you said in an email, um, you know, when you're reading something in an email, that, that fiery passion and that motivation, uh, that emotion doesn't shine through the same way as you can in person. And, and that in-person connection, that personal connection can really make a bigger impact. It also allows you to tailor the conversation to the person you're talking to. Similar to, as I, I just uh, gave an example, sometimes you're meeting with someone who knows nothing about your issue. Other times you're meeting with people that know your issue. You're not going to do the exact same meeting for both of those people. You can tailor it based on the experience and knowledge of the individual, um, which isn't just, uh, isn't as doable with some of the other advocacy techniques we'll we'll see moving forward. Now, one of the cons of hill visits is that they're very very labor intensive. You have to figure out who you want to target. You have to figure out who in their on their staff uh, you need to reach out to, what their contact information is. You then have to request the meeting. Uh, you then have to wait for them to get back to you, and when they don't get back to you, you have to follow up with the meeting. Or they can just simply ignore you or say no. Uh, but let's say they say yes. You then have to schedule the meeting. You then have to get to the Hill. You have to have the meeting. You have to do your post-meeting follow-up. And then you do this 534 more times if you're trying to reach every member of Congress. Plus, that doesn't even talk about any of the meetings you need to have with committee staff, who are people who work on the committee, but, uh, but not for a particular elected official. But are still very important in the process when crafting an appropriations bill or some other sort of legislative language. So very labor intensive. Um, I will say that we don't tend to try to reach out to all 535 um, offices for meetings. We tend to focus on the committees of jurisdiction as well as the, the elected officials that have a, a big geographic impact on the advocacy area. So uh, we reach out to the appropriations committee as well as some of the other committees that feed um, some items into that committee. The other con to Hill visits is that it's limited geographically. Sure, you can go and meet with your local congressman in their district office or, or meet with their person staff, but your local congressperson may not be on the committee of jurisdiction. Um, and, and so Capitol here is here in D.C., and so uh, you, know, you have to get here to D.C. to do some of the Hill visits, and, and that is one of the, the limits. So the next advocacy technique I'll talk about our organizational sign-on letters. And these are like petitions, but instead of individuals signing, they're organizations. And these are great because they're external. Um, th this is a way for external organizations to try to impact the internal processes of Congress. Uh, whether and, and these letters tend to be directed towards committees or specific elected officials or potential, uh, potentially leadership within uh, the elected officials. So this is a great way to show community support for an advocacy ask. And I put community in quotation marks because community can mean many different things in the advocacy world. 
It can be we're all working towards the same cause, like many of us on the phone, or it could be a geographical community, or it can be something else. But it is an ability for these organizations to come together and say, we, the undersigned, believe in X, Y, and Z, and wish for you to support us in this effort or to support our effort. Uh, the other really nice thing about organizational sign-on letters is that you may find champions uh, within your communities or from other communities, perhaps, that you didn't know were supportive of your advocacy cause. Um, you know, the saying goes, politics makes strange bedfellows very much applies here in that, uh, you know, there might be other organizations that are seeing an outsized impact due to increases in hepatitis that want to see new cases be reduced. Uh, because it supports what they're working on. So organizational final letters are really nice because they're usually not labor intensive. You can really sit anywhere and, and write something and then send it out. I mean, you can sit at your local coffee shop and, and knock this out or do it on a fishing trip. I mean, just pick a spot. You can write, write out a, a sign-on letter. Uh, additionally, because of the internet, you can coordinate it from anywhere. Um, this really allows a, a wonderful global coordination. And we've seen uh, many organizational sign-on letters um, you know, be written by someone in one place, but be signed on by people all across the country. Uh, so both of those make them a very nice and flexible um, advocacy tool. However, some of the cons are they are static. Once they're written, once they're signed on to, once they're sent in, they're, they're kind of set in stone. So you really have to make sure to think through all the different arguments and, and um, put it into a letter that's still concise enough that, you know, someone's not going to see a 100-page letter and then just roll their eyes and, and not ignore it. Uh, which leads us to our next con about sign-on letters, which is they can be ignored. Let's say you go through all this work, much like a petition, and you know, elected officials could easily just shrug and say, don't care, um, but that's not a reason to, to not try because um, you, know, you don't know what they're going to do, and, and this helps push that advocacy ask. Additionally, even if the elected official does shrug and say, I don't care, uh, the fact that you may find a previously unknown champion or just motivate your advocacy base uh, still makes organizational sign-on letters a great advocacy tool because you can take some of those same champions and apply them into other advocacy techniques um, being listed. So certainly a great item in the toolbox. So the next type of advocacy tool that um, we'll talk about is very similar to the last one, uh, a dear colleague letter. This is, again, like a petition but instead of individual citizens or organizations signing on to it, elected officials are the ones signing on to it. How this usually works is that um, an advocacy organization will reach out to a specific elected official and ask them to lead a dear colleague letter and work with that staff in crafting the, the language in it. So it really entail, it really contains the advocacy language that the, the, the community is working with. Um, that elected official's office will then send it around to all of their colleagues in Congress. Um, usually it's, it's House specific, so someone on the House side will do it to their House colleagues and someone on the Senate side will do it to their Senate colleagues. Um, so you're, you're working with an elected official's office to, to do this technique. Uh, but this is really a great way to show the political support for an advocacy ask. And, and so you're able to go and you're making your argument, you're, you're going to have these two letters that are signed on, you're like, hey, I have the support of the community, I have the support of your colleagues here in the House or here in the Senate, uh, you really, really should listen to what we're, we're saying and, and give us more money um, for, to, to do a non-nuanced way of how this argument goes. Uh, additionally, you may find previously unknown champions uh, for our FY19, sorry, not 19, our FY17 Dear colleague, letter in the House, uh, there were two Republican signers that hadn't signed on in previous years. And one of those signers signed on because of great work that, that had, the United had been doing with that office. But the other person signed on because they saw the letter and were like, yes, my community has, my, my jurisdiction has an outsized impact of new cases of hepatitis and we need to do something about it. So I'm going to sign on to this letter and support it. We had targeted this individual before and not really gotten very far with them um, just for a variety of reasons. So we were quite pleasantly surprised when they had signed on to the letter and it was a uh, you know, previously unknown champion. Um, additionally, one way to look at a dear colleague letter is sort of as like an inner office memo. 
Um, you can kind of couch it like accounting is sending a memo to finance to say, hey, buy us new computers. Uh, so it really does have that, that kind of force of being from colleagues um, to another elected official. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. The under the pros and cons, I'll, I'll actually reverse this order and start with that. It, they're, they're very credible, dear colleague letters, because they are coming from a part of the same group of elected officials to a different group of elected officials. Uh, and additionally, similar to the organizational plan on letters, they have the, the pros of being able to be coordinated from anywhere. You don't have to meet with that congressional office in person to get them to leave the letter. Some of the, the cons, though, again, are they are labor intensive. You have to work with that office to get that support um, going in both houses, and sometimes that's tough depending on what your ask is. Uh, again, they are static, um, and, and so once they're signed onto, they can't be changed, which uh, can be an issue uh, if you decide to change your advocacy ask in the middle of the year, like we did in 2018, which will, or for FY18, which I'll touch on later, and they can be ignored, which is never a nice thing, but it's possible. Uh, and then lastly, you know, you do all this effort, and it's possible that you find out that there aren't that many elected officials who want to sign on to a letter. They might have, they might support your advocacy ask privately, but they aren't willing to go on the record publicly for it, and therefore don't sign on. So one of the next, the next advocacy technique I will dive into are congressional briefings. And these are, it's kind of a catch-all for events held on or near Capitol Hill. And really this is just, uh, this is a chance for an organization to uh, entice a bunch of congressional staffers into a single room as a group to conduct a, either a presentation or some sort of panel conversation uh, or maybe a Q&A. So normally organizations work with a congressional office to reserve space on the Hill, and then they bring in outside speakers or other experts to go and address some people who end up showing up that are usually congressional staffers, and uh, have a chance to go have this Q&A. And, and there are some really great pros and cons to congressional briefings versus Hill visits. So one of the great pros of the congressional briefing is that you can get potential media exposure. Uh, it's rare that the media wants to show up at a Hill visit with a staffer, but it's different when you bring an expert onto the Hill and, um, and do a briefing. And actually, very often in, in the D.C. press, we see, like, actress so-and-so is going on the Hill today to advocate for X, Y, and Z. And, and sometimes they're doing meetings, and other times they're just coming on for a briefing. But just that, that congressional, that media exposure can be helpful in your ask the ask. Additionally, the group setting can be very, very energizing. Let's say that you're a congressional staffer that walks into a room because your boss told you they needed you to come cover this um, briefing about why hepatitis needs more money, and you're like, I don't really want to, but I will. But then you're in the room, and, and hepatitis advocates are very fiery and motivated people, and that energy rubs off on you, and you're like, oh, you know, I learned something new today and realize that this is a much bigger issue than I realize, especially for the area that I'm representing. Um, yes, actually, let's, I'm now motivated to do something. Uh, that group feel is something you can't replicate in a, a Hill visit as easily. Um, the, the downsides to it, though, are briefings are very labor intensive. If you've ever put together an event, you know that there's a lot that goes into it. You have to find a sponsor, on a congressional sponsor. You have to book a room. You have to book your speakers. Maybe you have to book their travel as well. You need to design handouts and get them printed out. Maybe you're ordering food and need to figure out how much food you're ordering. So now you need to build an RSVP system. Uh, you have to find time to promote it. You need to reach out to all those media people. A lot goes into it. Um, and because a lot goes into it, they can be expensive. Normally, the rooms don't cost money, but uh, speaker travel or food costs um, can can really make this a more expensive advocacy technique. And that can be questionable if uh, because you do have uncertain attendance. Even if you have 200 people sign up to attend, uh, the rule that I was always taught when grassroots organizing was expect half the people to show up that actually RSVP to show up. And that number nowadays with, with some of the more electronic-based RSVP systems, I think it's even lower, expect fewer people to show up. Um, plus things happen on the Hill. Maybe a, a, a shutdown occurs that you weren't expecting to occur and your briefing gets uh, canceled as a result, or you're competing with other briefings. Um, 
Uh, the opposite is true as well, though. Maybe you're expecting only 50 people to show up and you have 100 to show up. And now all of a sudden your, your room just doesn't fit everyone and it's hot and stuffy. So there's some uncertainty with this technique, but it can still also be good, which is also say many moving parts. And with anything with many moving parts, things could go off the rails. So this next one is uh, an item that Emily touched on already, but it's report language. And honestly, of the six advocacy techniques that uh, I will discuss, this one I think is the most DC specific. Uh, so really this is, these are instructions that are included with the appropriations bill talking about what money should be spent on or what money can't be spent on. So it, you know, the, for, the example of the first part would be language that says money should be, money in this agency should be spent on this list you know, X, Y, and Z, or should focus on uh, the hardest hit areas or, or seeing the biggest increases in new cases of hepatitis. That's saying what money should be spent on. Uh, Emily gave a perfect example of the, the other side of this was what money can't be spent on uh, in the terms of um, syringe service programs can't spend money on syringes themselves. And that is a piece of language in a report language that is saying that money can be spent on X, Y, and Z, but not syringes themselves. Uh, but in general, this is instructions from Congress to the executive agencies. And one of the best pros out of all of these is that this truly does impact executive branch decision making. It doesn't necessarily carry the authority of law. If you ignore report language, you're not going to be let out in handcuffs. But in general, uh, it requires a response from the executive branch. And executive branch wants to keep Congress happy in this regard because Congress is the one who controls the person purse strings. So report language is one of those items that really sort of forces a back and forth communication. It's Congress saying like, we heard what you said, we're saying that you have to do this instead, or we're saying you have to do, continue doing what you've been doing. Um, and, and then on the next round of funding requests, the agencies really need to answer why they didn't do it or answer that they have been doing it. The the downside to report language, or I guess the con to report language is, uh, it does a congressional ally. It's not like an outside person can go and just insert report language. You do have to get a member of Congress to insert it. And they're a little bit more hesitant to, to do something with the report language than they are to lead a, a letter. So it really does require building that relationship with an office and getting them to be okay with, with really going on the record uh, around a specific advocacy area. There's also the potential unattended effect of report language. And this is rare, but should be mentioned in that a lot of times you're trying to attach report language to an advocacy request uh, for additional money or less money. But in this case, we're just going to talk about additional money. And so let's say that your advocacy request is, or your report language says, more focus needs to be paid toward um, the hardest hit areas of new cases. But your intent was that report language to only be included if there was additional money coming because you don't want to go and have the existing programs that are already being well run have to adjust what they're doing. And, and so there's runs the scenario of you don't actually get the additional funding you're looking for, but now you've included report language that you can't get pulled out of the bill because you just didn't make sure it got pulled out or the staffer didn't do it. And now all of a sudden you have report language that you want to be ignored. And as I just said, it's tough to ignore. So, there is a, a slight downfall to report language, but in general, it is uh, one of the, the stronger advocacy techniques because um, it does require a response from the executive branch. And then the last advocacy technique I will touch on are coalitions. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with coalitions, but it is important enough to mention because it, it really, really does uh, in just important items within our work. Uh, so, you know, a coalition is just organizations coming together to form a single entity um, across communities or from within the same community, a community having that previous definition of, of that, that has already been mentioned, uh, and can focus on specific advocacy areas like eliminating new cases of hepatitis or a more general idea. Uh, there's a big coalition here in D.C. that focuses on safety net programs, all safety net programs within the federal government, and there are many. And so that's a pretty broad and general idea. Um, so 
the pros are, are big, great pros. Big, I'm, I'm giving two thumbs up right now. I know you can't see that, but um, it's a pro because we are stronger together. It is better to have an advocacy ask that has the support of 50 organizations behind it than a single organization. Um, and it is a big pro because many hands make light work. If you have 50 things to get done, it's easier to parcel that out to numerous organizations than to try to take it all on yourself. Um, there are cons, though, and I am sure any of you who have, have been a part of a coalition uh, can agree that, um, you know, there are, is a such thing as coalition politics. Um, it requires some consensus, and, and whenever there's something that requires consensus, there is that, a, that possibility for hurt feelings. Um, there's also that possibility that things just take longer when you are working with a big group than when you are doing things unilaterally. Um, but that doesn't mean that those are necessarily big enough cons to, to outweigh the pros. And then the last one's a big one. Um, coalitions really do require trust. Um, the hope is, you know, you're hoping that other organizations will do what they said and that um, they'll stay on message, and then you also have to do what you said you would do and stay on message. So, uh, but these are, these are the six different advocacy techniques that we use the most here in DC, and I'm now gonna briefly touch on how we've applied these this last fiscal year to the, the advocacy apps that we, we did. So this first one is coalition. I started backwards and now going forward. Advoca our advocacy and practice, coalitions. This webinar is sponsored by three different coalitions. And what's great about these coalitions is I pulled this language from all three of these websites, these coalitions websites, and you'll see in the first two or five words the word coalition comes into it. Um, so coalitions are important. Um, this, this webinar is very coalition based and really this webinar is a coalition of coalitions. Um, I'm, I'm glad that everyone in the room laughed because it wasn't <laughs> that funny. Um, so uh, coalition is very important. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next slide which is uh, really the, the big part of our advocacy in action. So Hill visits. Uh, this group of coalitions did more than 100 hill visits last year. Um, I went back and counted them to the best of my ability. It is definitely over 100. And our hill visits last year, as I said, you know, hill visits very much are tailored to the specific person you're talking to, but in general, they followed the outline of um, introduction and then just either determining where the, the staff person was on their knowledge of hepatitis uh, and if they needed some, you know, knowledge or we just felt like we should brush up on it, would discuss hepatitis, discuss what the current state of hepatitis in the United States is, which was a lot of um, new cases due to the opioid crisis, um, some discussion of the new hepatitis B vaccine, um, discussion of the effective hepatitis C uh, treatment, and a lot of push around how prevention is better than trying to pay for new cases down the road. Um, there's a lot of information about, a, a lot of education about what DVH or the Division of Viral Hepatitis does, and then what our advocacy ask would help them do moving forward. Um, so that's the general structure of our Hill visits. Our Dear Colleague letter, um, we had one in the House and one in the Senate. Uh, in the House side, there was 44 bipartisan signers, which is great, and it's a, it's a top, it's a high number. Uh, you might be like, oh, well, that's only a tenth of all of the House of Representatives. You know, not everyone knows what hepatitis is, and not everyone. And there are some offices that refuse to sign on letters, and um, this was more than we'd had in previous years. We really did feel like it was a win. And on the Senate side, we we had 15 signers, which you know, was only 100 members of the Senate, and so 15 signers was a, a good amount. Um, and then on organizational sign-ons, uh, you know, we actually had two different letters this year. We had our original letter, which asked for 70 million. And then the new data came out about how bad viral hepatitis was getting in the United States. And, and we decided as an advocacy community, hey, we need to do more to, in order to have a bigger impact. And so we moved our, our number up to 134 million and did a second round, uh, a second letter. So the first letter had 62 different organizations sign on to it. And then the second letter had nearly 100. And what was great about the second letter is um, you know, going back to our coalition, the, when coming up with that higher number, um, the hepatitis community worked with other communities and in infectious disease and elsewhere. Um, and some of those people, because they were part of the buy-in of the original new, or the new number, um, continued that buy-in with signing on to um, the new letter. So there are two items on here you'll notice that isn't included in the slide, and those are briefings and report language. And they're not included in this slide because 
technically for FY18, we didn't have an appropriation specific briefing and we didn't have a, uh, we didn't have report language in last week's omnibus, but still want to touch on some prior successes with those. So report language, um, the, the HEP-B, HEP-B United, uh, yes, HEP-B United was able in the prior year's bill to uh, have report language included um, talking about implementing the viral hepatitis action plan, which includes the items that the hepatitis appropriations partnership absolutely supports, as well as great report language around um, more hepatitis B screening notifications at Veterans Affairs during NBA hospitals. So um, that was some prior success with report language. And then around briefings, uh, NVHR did a briefing this last year on the National Academy of Elimination Report that um, throughout that process, there were several mentions of uh, our advocacy ask. Uh, HEP-B United did a great briefing this last year on their storytellers program um, that also went into some of the different advocacy asks. And uh, both organizations are part of a upcoming briefing that's going to focus on one of those recommendations within the National Academy's report uh, around eliminating hepatitis through um, different on-the-ground efforts, including syringe service programs. And part of our advocacy ask includes you know, additional funding to do that sort of work. So I'm sure there will be some discussion on, on that impact. But um, all that is to say, uh, thank you for taking time to come onto the webinar today to listen to uh, what we're doing around advocacy here in DC. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much. That uh, really tied everything together back to the process and how advocates based here in DC or all over the country can really get involved in influencing um, the appropriations process. So we are going to move into the Q&A portion. Um, remember, you can still submit questions, but we've had some come in uh, already, so I'm going to start with those. Um, and also, I would like to read a comment that one attendee um, submitted. She just said, hi, my organization held a congressional briefing on the Hill that was extremely successful. Our strongest asset was having a patient advocate who spoke on her experience with liver cancer due to hepatitis B. So sometimes her advice was that sometimes storytelling is really the greatest tool for making health issues important for Hill folk. Thank you for sharing that. That was a great point. Um, and I certainly agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> uh, another good question we had come in. Um, do you think in the timeline, maybe considering the timeline as you laid it out, do you think it's best to try to do these Hill meetings in March when it seems like every other type of healthcare organization seems to be advocating on the Hill? Is that a pro or a con? <laughs> yeah, it is really difficult because I think, as I said, it always seems to start on time, but it never seems to end on time. March is insane on the Hill, but I do think that it is important to get in there as soon as possible in February or March because usually the House and Senate will still pick deadlines that fall in March and April um, so and are pretty strong on those. They haven't extended them even this year when we didn't know sort of how the fiscal year was going to play out. We still saw that the House had a deadline of mid-March. Um, so unfortunately, you do have to get in there when it's incredibly chaotic. Thank you. Um, another question was, do you find it more constructive? Okay more constructive to meet with a staff member or an actual legislator? I, uh, oh, no. I think it's more constructive to meet with a staff member. I would agree with that. Um, they, there tends to be fewer demands on their time. Um, and yeah, that would be the biggest one. They have more time talking. Okay, um, we have one. Is there a way to tie together harm reduction funding and hepatitis funding? They are so closely linked, so it makes sense to me. That is that is actually part of our appropriations ask, uh, our renewed appropriations ask. Um, within the CDC, jurisdictions can ask for a, a determination of need that allows them to open up federal, to use federal funds towards syringe service programs, that, that um, syringe service programs practice, uh, help practice harm reduction. Um, so yes, very much a, you know, an increase in money for the CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis can be used by jurisdictions if they've gone through the proper process um, towards harm reduction efforts. And it is certainly something that we discuss with certain offices on the Hill, um, very much, again, that tailoring the conversation to whom you're meeting with. Um, some offices, it doesn't come up as often as others, but we certainly do discuss it. 
great, thanks. Um, another one is about, somebody asked, who's wondering if it seems like in the past 10 years there have been more continuing resolutions and more federal government shutdowns. Is that the case? Has it become a lot more common? Yeah, it has. Um, I think that we've seen sort of an increased um, attention to the deficit in the past few years um, and just overall increased partisanship. Um, you know, I was kind of hoping that the past two fiscal years would be a little bit easier uh, as one party was controlling both the White House and Congress, but we really have seen that it hasn't, especially as we've had a government shutdown this year and we came close many other times this year. Um, we'll have to see what the new election brings us, um, but hopefully we'll actually have a fiscal year that starts in the same year that the fiscal, starts, fiscal year begins. I think that might be my new goal even before October 1st at the start. Emily. Uh, we have a comment question about asking, can there be more training for hepatitis B available? Um, this person feels they're a little harder to come by, but I think the more information out there, the better. Um, as Emily noted, I mean, we're working together as a broad viral hepatitis coalition, but um, this webinar is actually the first in a series that Hep United was specifically trying to offer to our, our members, but also to the broader advocacy community. Um, so I'm actually, I have, um, I have Kate Morara, the director of Hep United with us. So I don't know if she wants to add any comments on the trainings that we're hoping to add in, but we do, like, we do try to keep it. Um, Thanks. And to, to anyone that isn't already signed up for the Happy United listserv, um, we'll share that information with you. We do do um, actually monthly trainings on hepatitis B-focused programs, both advocacy-related and, and programmatic and educational-related. So um, just uh, sign up, and, um, and we'll also reach out to you and follow up to the webinar with information on how to join in on more happy related trainings. Thank you. Yeah, and there um, on the next slide is our uh, the email address advocate at hepb.org. If other people have specific interest in advocacy focused or other um, topics that you would like to see us cover on our webinars, we would be happy to receive that feedback and take suggestions from everybody. Um, let's see, do we have time for one more question? <laughs> one, one just came in. Um, but what would you say, what are your recommendations on how to keep partisan, po partisanship politics out of your Hill visit. I think it really goes back to what Frank was saying about tailoring the Hill visit. You know, pay attention to who you're meeting with, kind of tailor your conversation for that. You know, you might not want to talk about how important harm reduction is with somebody who is like talked about, I don't know, wanting to arrest drug dealers, or wanting to like, execute drug dealers, or, you know, that's an extreme example, obviously. but really make sure that, again, also going back to the patient experience and the individual experience or just sort of bringing it back to people, I think has always been really impactful. And I will say that for the issue of hepatitis and hepatitis elimination, it's a little bit easier to keep partisan politics mm -hmm. out of it because this is an issue that is impacting everyone regardless of um, where they're living, whether it's a red county or a blue county, everyone is seeing, we're seeing increases across the country. And so, um, and, and we've seen that in our Hill visits that there are offices on both sides of the aisle that are very, very receptive to, to the message because uh, at the end of the day, the elected officials do want to see um, improvements for their jurisdictions. Okay. So we are at exactly four o'clock. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but um, if you have any additional questions or comments, again, the email address advocate at hepb.org please feel free to send them there and I can connect you with either Emily or Frank. Uh, we also hope that you visit our website, sign up for newsletters and follow us on Twitter. All of our organizational handles are listed so that you can stay up to date on um, advocacy updates and action alerts that we send out and ways that you can get involved, send emails to your legislators. Uh, but on behalf of Happy United, just wanna say thank you again to NVHR um, and HAP and the AIDS Institute for helping out with this webinar and for Emily and Frank for your great presentations. Um, thank you all and have a wonderful rest of the day.